Good morning from a wet Western Cape to all our cancer survivors, cancer patients, and caregivers, net care oncology nurse navigators, and cancer staff members. A warm welcome to everyone that is joining today for the first time. Please take note that our cancer net care support group sessions is taking place on the last or the fourth Saturday of each month. For those of you who don't know me yet, I am Gretchen Minow. I'm the Cancer Services Manager for Psychosocial Support. I'm a registered um, social worker. Apologies from Rowan Robinson from NetCare. She's the lead nurse navigator for NetCare and she won't be able to join and facilitate our session today. We also have Lucy Bologna. And Lucy, can you please put on your video? Lucy is a familiar face. She's our Head of Media and Marketing at Cancer. And before I introduce our speaker, just a few house rules. Please mute yourself. There will be time for questions and answers. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat box. And if you have any questions, concerns, and suggestions, during the month, please email them to info at cancer.org.za. Many women are relieved or excited to be finished with the breast cancer treatment, but it can also be a time of worry, being concerned about the cancer coming back, or feeling lost without seeing the cancer key team on a regular basis. For some women with advanced breast cancer, the cancer may never go away completely. And these women may continue with the cancer treatments such as chemotherapy, hormone therapy, or other treatments to help keep the breast cancer under control and to help relieve symptoms from it. Our topic for today is the management and care of the mastectomy. And we are privileged to have one of our partners, Tashka Strafiala from the AIM store. Little bit more about Tashka. Tashka is no stranger to the Western Cape. She offers services in the Western Cape. She is a certified orthotist and prosthetist with a passion for helping women transition back into normal life after a mastectomy or lumpectomy. She will be speaking today about management and care post mastectomy lumpectomy and reconstruction. Tashka, I'm handing over to you now. Thank you, Gretchen. Can everybody can you hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I'm going to do my chat today. I'm going to switch my video off, but I'm going to uh, put a presentation on. So let me just quickly share my screen with everyone. Okay, so yes, today we're speaking about the management and care after a mastectomy, a lumpectomy or reconstruction. So thank you for your time today and the opportunity to present. Um, I think it's important to bring about an awareness of what options are available to ladies post-surgery. I've found that many women go through the breast cancer and mastectomy journey, have been in a fight for their life, and then come to the question, where do I go from here? So let's look, let's have a look at what's available post mastectomy. So we've got our external breast prosthesis, which is an, uh, it's a, a weighted artificial breast form made of silicone and is designed to simulate natural breast tissue and shape. A correctly fitted breast prosthesis will resemble breast in shape and size. Cosmetically, this helps the ladies restore their body image and confidence, and anatomically, it assists with balance and posture, as well as preventing a shoulder drop. They come in many different shapes, sizes, and colors. 
The breast prosthesis is kept in position by placing it inside a bra with a sewn in pocket referred to as a mastectomy bra. I'm just going to show you an example there. Alternatively, there are adhesive breast prosthesis available that stick directly onto the skin. The prosthesis are made either from silicone or a soft surgical cotton wool. The soft cotton wool prosthesis are referred to as fiber filled prosthesis. This is the one here on the left and are generally used directly after surgery and are lightweight option to sleep in. In the silicone breast, there are a variety of silicone and film used depending on the needs of the client. And these are skin friendly and seen as a more permanent breast uh, option once the surgical site has healed. So this is an everyday wear option and can be used during swimming and sports as well. Post lumpectomy and reconstruction, there are options available. Um, what often happens after a reconstruction is the ladies will either lose quite a bit of weight or gain weight, and then the reconstructed breast is no longer the same as the natural breast. Um, and in a normal lumpectomy, the breast tissue is a lot less. So as you can see in the picture on the right, it can be, there can be quite a lot of breast tissue left or almost nothing. So there's partial breast forms available for that. Okay, mastectomy bras. So mastectomy bras are different in structure than normal bras. Um, number one, they've got pocketed areas. Uh, the mastectomy bras have pockets to house a breast prosthesis or form. These pockets are sewn into the bra cups and are generally made from a soft silk-like material. The pockets are comfortable against someone's skin and further allows a small amount of air to ventilate the area between your chest wall and mastectomy bra. The second point is that it's got good pectoral coverage. It has a high sternal section that gives rise to a good pectoral cover to ensure the bra sits snug against the chest wall. And this will also prevent the bra from gaping when you bend forward. Underwire is not recommended. There are no underwire mastectomy bras on the market. Um, no, we, we don't want to put any restrictions on the lymph area, so we need to allow proper lymph drainage. The fourth point is a broad side wall, which is also for, for proper lymph drainage. Um, it ensures that the scar sites and potential skin and soft tissue left post mastectomy is comfortably contained and supported. It also provides additional support and surface area to enable the bra structure to carry the weight of the breast prosthesis. A question that I often get from ladies is, is there any um, strapless mastectomy bra on the market? Unfortunately, not at this stage. Um, the fifth point is a high sternal segment. This ensures that the breast or breast prosthesis are encapsulated. These will keep the breast prosthesis secure in place and prevent migration in the bra, as well as keep the bra snug against the torso. It's also made with very soft material to ensure that the areas that are sensitive post mastectomy and treatment are cared for. The bra on the left is called a flora bra. It's just a normal mastectomy bra. It's very pretty and lacy. The one on the right is called a lympho fit. Um, we see that quite a few ladies have a lot of post-surgery swelling. So this bra helps with uh, keeping the swelling down, almost like a massaging effect to help with the lymph drainage. And then onto lymphedema. I think the biggest thing I've seen in the last two years is that um, there's a big need for lymphedema awareness. Lots of the ladies come to me without even realizing that they have lymphedema. Um, it's a swelling in the arm or the chest wall area. And lymph is a clear colorless fluid that accumulates in the spaces between body cells and is collected by the vessels of the lymphatic system. Lymph flows through the lymphatic vessels to the lymph nodes, and this is what's often uh, removed during a mastectomy, and is eventually absorbed into the bloodstream. The lymphatic system plays an important role in the immune system, 
by filtering excess fluid, bacteria, and byproducts of infections in the lymph nodes. So lymphedema results when lymph builds up in the body tissue as the removal of water and protein from the body tissues does not take place. Normal lymph drainage in your arm and torso are also sometimes interrupted or hampered as a result of damage to lymphatic vessels. So there are quite a few different compression garments and lymphedema options. Generally, the ladies will come to me to see um, something for their breast, and then I'll pick up on the swelling. Um, I'll always refer them to a professional lymphedema therapist. So this will be a nurse or an occupational therapist that will provide manual lymph drainage. So that's the first stage. Then you get a compression. So there's compression sleeves. They are graduated compression. So the compression changes over the arm um, to help with the like a massaging method and with the drainage. So the sleeves are tighter at the bottom than they are at the top. Um, they feel soft. Sometimes they feel softer, sometimes they feel stiffer. And there are a number of compression classes. So there's different stages of compression and, um, and lymphedema. So I'll work quite closely with the lymph therapist to see what stage the patient is in. Um, and then we will work through a, a treatment plan. So generally we do decongestion and manual lymph drainage. And then the client will go into a compression garment. The sleeve that you see on the left is called the Mobiderm. It's a specialized material patented by a company in Germany. And it's got little dots in it and it's a nighttime sleeve. We usually use this for ladies that have quite stubborn lymphedema. And it provides a massaging type effect and it also unblocks the pores. Okay, costs involved. This is always a main question. Um, breast prosthesis can cost anywhere between around 600 Rand to 10 and a half thousand Rand. Um, there's lots of different types on the market. So the softy fiber filled ones are the most affordable. And the ones that are 10 and a half thousand Rand are actually custom made. So a 3D print is taken of um, the lady's chest wall. And then we try and match color um, and, and fall of the remaining breast. Um, mastectomy bras cost between 800 and two and a half thousand rand, just depending on the style and the make. And then lymphedema garments also cost between a thousand and two and a half thousand rand, depending on what's needed. Um, medical aid does cover these things. I would say discovery is probably the best when it comes to that. There are oncology benefits, um, appliance benefits, and prosthetic benefits that cover these things. The, the process is that a lady will get referred to one of our stores. Um, they will make an appointment. We do a fitting, and we administer the account for them. So they don't need to do anything, and there's, there's nothing that they need to cover because we first send a quotation through. So who are the people that you need to go and see for this? Um, a certified orthotist and prosthetist is the best. Um, it's important to know that you can go to any orthotist. It doesn't have to be someone from an M store. Um, the M store is just, uh, you know, our practices have specialized in mastectomy care. There are Cape Town, Johannesburg and, and uh, Durban branches. And I think Lucy has got all the details for them, so she can forward that on to anyone that needs it. Um, and then I did, yes, I've got two videos here of ladies that share their journey from when they've had a mastectomy to the point where they get their prosthesis. Um, they explain why they didn't go for a reconstruction and the process that they went through of getting a prosthesis and the bras that they used. 
I unfortunately can't play it because the sound is not working over Zoom. And that's the last slide. Let me just put my video back on. Thank you, Toshka, for your presentation. Our group are smaller today, so I want to open um, up for questions. Do you have any questions? I think, um, Toshka, a question that we come across at our cancer care centers a lot um, is the ladies or well, the cancer patients wants to know um, when is the right time um, for them to get a silicone um, prosthesis. Is there a specific period? Because when they are in hospital, they first get a soft lid and then um, they want to equip a silicone prosthesis. So are they at right time? Are you muted? Okay, I actually did have that in my presentation. I'm not sure how I skipped that. So that is a very common question. Um, and so medically, it would depend on the healing of the, um, the surgical site um, and whatever oncology treatment the ladies are still on. So generally when they're on radiation, their skin is extremely sensitive. They don't want anything against them. So four to six weeks after the mastectomy, they go into the softy. And then afterwards, they'll generally go into the silicone prosthesis. Yeah, and I think uh, Sashka, another question uh, that is coming up in my head um, is that they're trying to um, restore normality for the ladies. Um, or do you have different breast prosthesis according to the skin colors, or does that not matter? No, 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 it definitely matters. Um, so generally you won't see the prosthesis because it's sitting inside a mastectomy bra, but I mean, you still know that it's there. So it does come in different colors and it comes in different shapes. So we'll always match the remaining breast as close as possible in um, color and shape and size, obviously. And um, was the other point? I can't remember. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, Toshka, once again. And um, as Toshka said, she is in the Western Cape. Um, I know she's traveling to most parts of the Western Cape, uh, a lot of time on the road. The practice is in Rondebosch, and then they also have the service offering in KZN and Gauteng. Um, and we did post in the chat box um, how you can get hold of the in-store and the products. I just want to give you the opportunity for questions, any questions relating um, to mastectomies, lumpectomies. Um, Richard, yeah, anyone to direct that wants to share this story. Question, there is a question there from Tanya on the chat box. Oh yes, so Tanya is going in on the 5th of November. She wants to know if she should take anything with her. Um, hi Tanya, yes, so generally the surgeons don't provide anything. So what would be a good idea is for you to get a little pillow for underneath your arm and a post mastectomy bra. So it's a nice compression bra that opens and closes in the front um, and helps with drainage and swelling after your operation. And you can get that by me. Perfect. I'll see you then. <laughs> Thank you, Sonia. So you also offer the pillows, um, Sashka, did I hear correctly? Um, I'm busy sourcing pillows now. I do get a lot of questions for them. Um, do you know which ones I'm talking about? The abduction pillow for under yeah. the arm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not some. If you look up online, it's not something that we we get in this country. 
but it is, I think it's quite easy to make. So it almost looks like a boomerang shape. So if I don't have something in stock, whenever the ladies ask me a question about it, I always, oh, you see that she started making mastectomy pillows. So yes, we must definitely have a chat about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Tanya, for sharing. Um, yes, Lucy just suggested that um, all of you can unmute yourselves and you are welcome because we have still a little bit of time left to share your story, concerns, um, if you need resources, um, any questions you can ask or, or share your stories or challenges because uh, we might have new survivors. Um, somebody was that was diagnosed only recently that is joining today and um, somebody that can offer advice or where's with the journey that we can learn from. So please feel free to unmute and share your story. You, um, yeah. Alice. Good morning, Alice. Alice, you are muted. Are they? Are they? Good morning, Tanya. Hi, sorry, can I, I just wanted to say something to you before I made that appointment. Um, I'm a second time cancer fighter and they've been explaining my surgery to me. And apparently they were going to do a double, but because of the extensive surgery they have to do and the, the cancer that I have, they've now gone to a single first time round and then they will go on to a double later. But um, can I still do a... Uh, wear a bra just after surgery if they're going to be cutting off 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters off my chest wall and then using obviously my back or under my collarbone or my thigh lymph um, um, blood vessels so would it not be too painful or would I still wear a surgery bra so the surgery that you're going to go for um so it sounds like what they're going to do is they're going to use um like you said from fat from the back or from your legs or your tummy to do almost like a reconstruction with the blood vessel um, I would definitely wear a bra um, any, okay. anything post-surgery whether it's an augmentation or a reconstruction or whatever it is um, you can benefit from a, a post-surgery bra yes okay perfect thank you sure Any questions? I'm not sure if Alice is on. I wanted to ask Alice, um, as a nurse navigator, what they advise their patients um, to get ready for the surgeries. Um, so Alice, if you are on, can you please unmute yourself and maybe just share tips with the cancer patients on here today. She's muted. Um, she can unmute. Everybody can unmute. Um, I wonder if she might be distracted or on a call, perhaps. Yes, yes. Any other questions? Abida, sorry um, to put you on the spot, um, but I know you quite well. Can you perhaps um, share your journey? 
Sorry, a bit up before we continue. I just received a message. You see, Colin says that the host is not allowing. Oh, that's okay. No, it definitely should be now. Sorry about that. Corinne, are you able to speak? There you go. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, one question. Can you give me some more information on your mobility once you've heard the government says to me? Um, no reconstruction and the link to me. What is your mobility possibility? Uh, sorry, Corin, I can't hear you that well. Are you asking about mobility after a mastectomy? After okay, double mastectomy and lymphectomy. Uh, and lymphectomy. The, the lymph nodes. Yes, yeah. so you will be um, quite limited in lifting up your arms and being able to go to the, fore, to the front and to the back. But you will definitely get um, physiotherapy and something that they don't generally do, but what I would always recommend is to go for a session at a lymph therapist, at least one, so that she can show you how to massage your arm manually and um, which exercises you need to do to get your mobility back. So it is gonna be restricted, but it is something that you can work on. I can give you some details of ladies that I work with to help with this. Thank you, that would be great. And um, I've asked you when I remember. <laughs> so. Lauren, did you have yes. another question? I forgot what I want to ask. I'll ask you when I remember. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, but thank you, Colin. Anybody else? Abida, as a survivor and a cancer staff member, can I ask you to share uh, your journey? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I let me just open my video. Okay. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Abida. I was diagnosed in two thousand and nine. Um, originally, I felt a kind of a lameness in my right arm, and I went to my local GP. Um, who asked me, you know, do I often use the computer? And I said, yes. And she prescribed some anti-inflammatory meds. Um, she admitted later that she had misdiagnosed me. Um, two weeks later, the lameness was still there. Um, and I went to another GP because that morning when I took a shower, I felt a little nodule um, in my right armpit. And uh, when I went to the doctor, um, he examined me and um, he said, I'm going to send you for a mammogram. And I said, but I've actually been for a mammogram three months prior to that. Um, so he said, OK, we'll do an ultrasound also, uh, because when he put some pressure um, under the armpit, it was very painful. Um, and he said, we definitely need to have that checked out. So I said, oh, I thought you're just going to take a little needle and prick, you know, and that's the end of the boil. And he said, no, 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 no. We need to have a check that. Um, I don't think it's a boil, but let's do some further investigation. So off I went, um, you know, for uh, the mammogram. And uh, once again that morning, uh, when they did the mammogram, they actually said, but you had been here three months ago. Um, is nothing showing on the mammogram. So I said, yes, I know, um, but I've been booked for an ultrasound also because I have this little boil in my armpit. Only when they did the ultrasound that they discovered um, two small tumors in the right breast uh, and the one in the armpit was the largest. Um, and, you know, 
the radiologists, they don't normally talk to you when they do these tests. Um, they make their own calculations and they say, okay, um, after doing the measurements, um, you can go wait inside and um, we will speak to your GP and we'll get back to you. Um, I waited in um, the reception room and uh, my husband was not here at the time. Uh, he was overseas. Um, so um, he gave me a call and he said, um, so everything okay? And then I just burst into tears and I said, um, I don't think so. And um, the receptionist saw me cry and she, she ushered me to the back. And uh, Shortly afterwards, the radiologist came to me and she said, I've just spoken to your GP. Um, we got an appointment for you to go see a specialist in two hours time. And that's when I knew this, obviously, you know, something wrong. Anyway, um, I went to the uh, specialist and I waited there, you know, so many things going through my mind at the time. And uh, when he saw me, he explained he was going to do a biopsy. Um, and first and foremost, he was going to give me an injection. Uh, when he did the biopsy on the breast, that wasn't painful, but when he did it, it drew some fluid from the armpit, it was very, very painful. And he advised me to come back the next morning at office eight. I then went home. Um, I actually spoke to my kids and uh, my siblings. And I said, you know, just keep me in your prayers. I know there's something wrong, but I'm praying for the best. And uh, my eldest daughter and my sister said they will accompany me the next morning at office eight. And um, the specialist then confirmed that I did indeed have uh, breast cancer. And he scheduled me for an op um, the following Friday. I was stunned when he said, you know, that I do indeed have cancer. I didn't ask anything. I just stared at him. My daughter and my um, sister asked all the questions and um, they wanted to know what's going to happen in sports. When we got home, I asked my children just to give me time. I need to go sit outside in the sun. And uh, I did, and I prayed to God to give me the strength and actually to embrace me with his arms and assure me it's going to be okay. So, yes, uh, from henceforth, my journey started. I had a good cry, but I knew then it was going to be okay. Um, and God is going to help me on this journey. Um, my husband came back. Um, that day and um, he wanted to find out from the specialist why was the op only scheduled for the next week and not the following day and the um, specialist um, was very very um, amenable and said you know why don't you and your children come along and I can explain everything to you so they went in the following day and he explained that it's important for me to realize and accept that they're going to remove my right breast. And that's part of me that's gonna be gone. And I need to internalize that and work through that. And um, they then ask him, you know, all the questions they were unsure about. And my husband and kids felt more reassured. Um, and they gave me all the support at the time. I had the up the Friday, I went in at 12. Um, when I came out later, um, the specialist came around and said um, they had removed lymph nodes and he will let me know uh, the results thereof. You know, they have to send everything away for further testing. 
I didn't react very well to the anesthetic. Um, I was very sick. And when visiting hour came around, um, I actually asked my husband not to let the kids see me in that state. Um, I suffered, I think, from post-trauma shock um, because uh, my body kept on shaking. They kept on piling blankets on top of me and they gave me an injection. And I just couldn't stop wrenching. And um, my family went home and then I couldn't sleep that night. But during that night, I did a lot of soul searching and I realized I cannot let this get me down. I need to face it head on. I'm going to get through this. I need to be positive and I need to force myself to eat something. So the next morning at six o'clock, I asked the nursing staff um, if I could have some chili. And she said, well, she'll have to clear it because everything that I had previously, you know, didn't stay in. I said, no, I know I need some chili. This is what my body is telling me. Please ask the kitchen to prepare some chili for me. And um, I had some chili afterwards and that stayed in. And at two o'clock that afternoon, I was sitting in the reception waiting for my family to visit me. And I knew that now, you know, I'm more positive. And it's going to be one day at a time. And with that positive attitude, um, I, you know, kept on going day by day. Um, I saw uh, my specialist. Um, I was in hospital for about six days until the drain had cleared. And um, then I was sent home. And five weeks later, um, I returned to the specialist and he told me that... Um, of the seven lymph nodes they had removed, five of them was indeed cancerous. And um, he was going to refer me to an oncologist now and the oncologist who discussed my treatment plan with me. Um, I was then scheduled to see the oncologist the next week and she explained um, that I was going to have six months of chemotherapy at the time. It was once per month. The first three would be the normal um, red devil, uh, but the last three would be more intense. Um, with the, um, oh, and they diagnosed um, my cancer as stage three plus, a very aggressive cancer. Um, and um, it's, it was definitely not hormonal. So they referred to it as the HER2 um, cancer. And uh, the first uh, chemo went very well because I had sucked myself up psychologically. It was going to be okay. I was going to cope with it. So it went well. Um, the second chemo, while I was having the chemo, I had this desperate craving for fish and chips. And off I sent my husband to go buy some. And uh, I think I probably ate about two chips and a small piece of fish and then they had to stop the chemo because then I started wrenching um, and I had to wait for an hour for that to subside and they had to start all over again and then I realized it's best not to eat anything while I was having my chemo. Uh, after the second chemo I definitely started feeling the changes. Um, I had such a severe headache one night uh, my friend came along and she up my head but the light was dimmed and when she had finished and I had fallen off asleep, they put the light on and she was so shocked when she saw half of my ear lying on the pillow. And she was in tears and she asked me, are you okay? Do you realize, you know, that most of your hair is busy falling out? And I said, yes, I do realize that and I'm okay with it. I actually want to see the physical transformation I don't want to shave with my hair. I want to see what is happening to me. So between the second and third <laughs> chemo, I could actually see the physical changes occurring. Obviously, it impacted greatly on my health um, because my appetite decreased dramatically. Um, everything nauseated me because chemo affects your taste buds. Um, everything tastes like cement. So... 
uh, you know, the smell of uh, fish oil in the house or anything being fried was just nauseating. Um, and uh, as I stated, I, my appetite decreased uh, tremendously. Um, I, most of the things I couldn't eat and I started to experiment with what would stay in and, you know, what would be best for me. And amazingly, uh, pickled fish was the only thing that stayed uh, with me. Um, so for breakfast, I would have dry salty cracks with the weak ginger tea. That worked for me. I couldn't, you know, just the sight of seeing berry juice or anything red reminded me of the chemo. I couldn't tolerate tea or coffee or anything with milk in it. Um, couldn't tolerate my famous Nando's or Kentucky or um, the sweet and sour dishes, none of it. Just the pickle fish for lunch and supper every day. I survived on that. Um, that is what my body needed at the time. Uh, you know, all our bodies uh, need different things and our body will actually tell us um, what is good for us and what it needs at the time. And then after the third chemo, um, you know, after every week when you, have the, when you have the chemo, the next week they will do the blood test to check if your count is high enough. So after the third chemo, I went on her septum and taxotere. And for that, I had to take 17 steroid tablets because it was very intense. Um, and those steroid tablets, oh, it makes you irritable. You can't sleep. You feel as if you're on a high you know, um, you just feel as if you're outside of your body, you've got no control over it. Um, so with the result, um, when I had that chemo the following week, I just returned from the blood test and I would just come home and I would get a phone call. You need to be admitted to hospital. Your count is too low. And then I would be admitted for a week. And, oh, I found those... Every time the needle prick, you know, drawing of the blood, it was very, very intense. Um, I must say it, it didn't gel very good with me. Um, I um, was also put in a private ward every time because of my immune system being so low um, and limited to visitors, you know, and everybody had to wear a mask whenever, whenever they came to visit. Uh, so yes, it was very, very taxing. Um, I didn't like the hospital food. I didn't want to go on inshore. Um, and I spent most of my nights in hospital lying awake and just doing lots of uh, self-reflection, you know, um, thinking about things, you know, of the past and letting go of whatever had hurt or impacted me. Um, prayed a lot and asked a lot of God to grant me the strength um, just to cope on a daily basis. Um, during the day, um, I would walk through the hospital, sit outside in the, the gardens, you know, try and remain positive. Obviously I had to get um, blood transfusions also at the time. Um, and I must say, you know, chemo affects your mood swings because, you know, whenever they used to look for, for a vein, um, sometimes when they insert the needle, the vein collapses. And then they have to try another vein and, um, sorry, everyone is not that equipped to be gentle when doing this, you know, and I would sometimes say, please remember, this is a piece of flesh you're working with. It's not a piece of cement. Take your time, you know, um, it's hurtful, you know, um, I'm in no rush. I'm not going anywhere. So I know you're busy, but please, you know, um, take your time when you insert that needle. And I remember at one stage, I actually told the nurse after she had tried four times, please just get a doctor to do it. Um, I can't take this, you know, your trial and error efforts. So yes, it does impact, as I say, on your mood swings, you know, um, you do go through periods of high and low. Um, I must admit also during this time, um, I actually prayed to God and said, you know, God, if this challenge is too much. 
if this challenge is too much for me, just grant me the peace and contentment to deal with it. Um, and uh, as I stated, one day at a time. But I love the fact that every day God gifted me with another day. And I was very grateful for that. Um, I loved going to the beach and I used to spend hours on the beach. But because I was having chemo, I knew I had to have myself covered. So I would walk with a sun hat and a light blanket and sit on a, on, on a chair, an armchair um, uh, in the sand and just feel the water, you know, um, crawling up to me. And that felt good. And that's the time, you know, that I felt closest to God because if I look around me, I see God's creation all around me. And I think, you know, wow, I'm so blessed. I'm still alive. And um, I think that is, that is very important for anyone that's going through this journey to know that, you know, um, God gives you the strength and you need to trust and embrace that. And you're not in charge of this journey and you need, need to let go. But you're going to get through it. So yeah, um, when I finished my chemo, I had to wait five weeks and then I was scheduled for three weeks of radiation. Um, every day, Monday to Friday. I must say the radiation um, wasn't as traumatic as the chemo experience. Um, it does tire you a lot. And the fact that, you know, you can't touch that area where you get radiated you know, um, you need to, to actually take care of that. Obviously, after every radiation session, I used to add some mazina onto that areas and not wash those areas and actually cover it. But I did have the strength to do my own cooking um, and drive myself because um, I felt, you know, very positive and I knew I'm nearing the end of my journey. And... Uh, Sorry, after three weeks uh, when my radiation finished, um, I saw my oncologist again and she said, well, Abida, that's the end of your journey. And I said, oh, you're not putting me on any tamoxifen. And she said, no, because um, your journey was not hormonal. It would be like putting diesel in a petrol car. It's not gonna benefit you. So you need to go regularly for checkups it's one day at a time. There are no guarantees. Um, so we'll see you every three months and, you know, we'll take it from there. Never once during this whole entire journey since I was diagnosed was the word reconstruction ever discussed with me. It's only a year after I completed my treatment um, that my specialist asked me, would you like to have reconstruction? And I said, no, I'm happy. Um, with what God has given me and what God has taken away. And um, I discussed it with my husband and he says, you know, uh, you are so courageous and you're more beautiful than ever. I don't need you to go through anything. If you are happy with how you look, I'm happy. That's the most important thing. It's about you and how you feel. And I'm grateful for that. I had tremendous support from family and friends. Um, I think the most important thing for me was when I was diagnosed, um, I actually went to all my neighbors and told them that I had been diagnosed. And I said, I'm not coming to you to ask you to come and clean my house or to cook for me, but I just want you to keep me in your prayers. And that's what they did. Um, they, they were very grateful for the fact that I actually came to them and, you know, I was brave enough to tell them about my diagnosis and ask them to walk the journey with them. Um, my husband often commented, I didn't know, you know, so many people. And I said, I didn't. Cancer, my family just grew with cancer. So, yes, um, as I stated, that was 12 years ago. Um, and I'm very, very grateful for God um, for having taken me on this journey because it made me so much stronger. It made me realize, you know, um, don't stress about small things. Let go if you, because you're not in charge of it, you know, and enjoy the beauty of life. 
It's really a treasure. Be grateful for every day. Thank you. Thank you, Abira, for sharing your journey and powerful story, Abira, and very inspirational. Um, so after Abida's journey, she became a cancer volunteer. She is a social worker and you know, she has started six support groups in Cape Town and just to make the cancer journey a little bit lighter for the cancer patients. Thank you very much, um, Abida, for everything that you do. I just because our topic is on management and care after mastectomy, I would also like to remind all the cancer patients and survivors to go for their regular mammograms. If you had a lumpectomy or a partial mastectomy, preferably six to 12 months after your surgery, you will have to go for a mammogram and then for, a late, for the ladies that had a mammogram, will go on a yearly basis um, for the mammograms. Then also for a pelvic exam, especially for the ladies that is taking the moxifen, and we know that governmental hospitals for most of the, the breast cancer patients, they, as part of the treatment, they use the moxifen. Um, they still have to go for pelvic exams um, every year because these drugs can increase their risk for uterine um, cancer. And we know that uterine cancer are one of the five leading cancers that is affecting women in South Africa. Um, we also want to say to Sonia, good luck um, for your surgery. Um, and just keep in mind, um, I know that this is so cliche, but Always remember you are braver than you are, then you believe stronger than you seem and smarter than you think you are and more love than you will ever know. Um, as a social worker, when we work with our patients, most of them we know that cancer treatment, cancer diagnosis can be a roller coaster ride and patients might think that they are not coping and like Abida said, sometimes you have to do retrospect. You have to, um, yeah, look look at what was happening in the past. Your roles, you evaluate everything. And we also do what I do with my patients. And something that you can also do in your own time is body part and deep breathing. We had a session on mental resilience. Um, so, so body part debriefing is when you look at your cancer journey, um, what, what you have been dealing with and you take the strength and you take the good from that journey. Um, and you take your body parts like the eye, something new that you have seen in your family. Uh, like Abida said, the support that she, she received from friends and family. So that I can represent something that you've seen in your family or friends, something new or a vision. Um, we all know that when you get diagnosed by cancer, a life for some, it might be like threatening. Then you change the vision that you have for yourself. Your stomach could represent the guts that you have to do something. And also it can represent um, you were in your comfort zone and now cancer has pushed you out of your comfort zone. So it can you can list all of that. The brain could be something that you have learned about yourself. Um, somebody you've met at the hospital or in a support group. The heart can be all of the things that you have experienced in your journey. Um, I know that a better as she a story from our heart today. And the hand can be everybody that has supported you or that you have um, supported. And the ear could represent all the good advice that you received during your journey. And please share your journey, your advice, and everything that you have learned on your journey 
with a fellow survivor or another patient that gets diagnosed with a similar cancer. I would like to say, Alice just said that she has to go. She, they have load shedding and a battery flow. Thank you, Alice, for joining. And um, yeah, I would just like to thank Toshka Strapella um, for the valuable information for today. And the in-store are also offering these services at a at all the cancer care centers in South Africa. And then we also put on the information of the in-store in the chat box. If you want to get hold of the of the in-store and you didn't take down the details, please um, contact info at cancer.org.co.org.za and then also our toll-free line, 0800 266 22. Um, please feel free to contact us for any information, resources, clinical um, queries. Um, please email us and thank you, Abida, Tanya, and Karen for sharing today. Um, a support group is there for sharing, giving information. Um, so thank you um, once again for sharing your stories and questions with the rest of the group. And then if you have any preference for a certain topic or there's more information you would like to know on or a topic that we can cover for our next sessions to come, please also email us at info at Thank you, Lucy, for co-hosting. And um, yeah, till next time, have a nice day, everyone. Goodbye.